Much better. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. <sighs> nice to see you all. And uh, it seems it's a busy 2024 already. So I have quite a few notes for you. Um, so please bear with me, and then I'll try to answer your questions as best I can. OK, we'll start with some updates on Gaza. Our humanitarian colleagues report that heavy Israeli bombardments continue as those fighting between Israeli forces and Palestinian armed groups, as well as Palestinian rocket fire into Israel. Over the past few days, further attacks hit residential structures and infrastructure in Gaza with high numbers of casualties reported. An estimated 1.9 million Palestinians, that's roughly 85% of the population, remain displaced. In the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, 2023 was the deadliest year for Palestinians as the UN started recording casualties there in 2005, with 507 Palestinians recorded killed. During the same period, the UN recorded 36 Israeli fatalities and attacks by Palestinians from the West Bank, which was also the highest figure since 2005. And over the past year, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs also recorded 1,225 incidents that involved Israeli settlers in the West Bank and, and resulted in Palestinian casualties, property damage, or both. This is the highest number since OCHA started recording this trend in 2006. The increase has caused displacement and deepened humanitarian needs in many areas of the West Bank. The number of incidents resulting in casualties or property damage among Israeli settlers in 2023 is 140, compared with 329 in 2022. And on Friday, we issued a statement in which the Secretary General expressed his concerns about the further spillover of this conflict, which could have devastating consequences for the entire region. And I believe you re all received that. Um, turning to Syria. Um, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is concerned about the impact on civilians of escalating hostilities in the northwest of the country, as well as the potential for the violence to jeopardize cross-border missions by UN staff. We carried out more than 300 such missions last year to meet with impacted people, monitor assistance programs, and conduct needs assessments. Over the weekend, shelling in residential neighborhoods in Idlib and western Aleppo left at least seven people dead. Nine of the nearly 30 people reportedly injured were children, including a two-month-old baby. At least two schools northwest of Aleppo were also damaged. And since October 5th, more than 100 people have been killed, almost 40% of them children, due to shelling and other violence in northwest Syria. More than 400 others have been injured. We and our partners continue to monitor the situation and respond to humanitarian needs, including by providing support to health facilities, which are under additional strain due to an increase in respiratory diseases and other winter-related challenges. Turning to Ukraine, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that attacks continue today with vast aerial assaults in several regions causing death, including several children, and destruction of homes and other civilian infrastructure. The capital, Kyiv, and the city of Kharkiv in the east have been most impacted in today's attack, and damages have been reported in nine of the capital's 10 districts. In a statement, the humanitarian coordinator for Ukraine, Denise Brown, condemned the attacks, noting that civilians in Kyiv and in the Donetsk region were left without electricity or water, while temperatures are forecasted to reach minus 20 degrees Celsius this week. Our humanitarian colleagues also point out that today's strikes follow the pattern of the latest wave of attacks on populated areas in the country since the 29th of December. We, along with our partners, are on site and have been providing emergency assistance, supporting civilians whose homes were damaged or destroyed in many parts of Ukraine. And in Kyiv to date, aid organizations are providing construction materials for rapid repairs of homes, first aid, and psychological support, complementing efforts from authorities. And in Kharkiv, humanitarians are prov provided medical and psychological aid, hot meals and drinks, blankets, and materials for emergency repairs. On the response front, on the last day of 2023, the 105th Humanitarian Interagency Humanitarian Convoy successfully delivered aid to nearly 1,500 civilians in a frontline town in Kharkiv region. The convoy brought essential supplies, including food baskets, hygiene supplies, kits for people with special needs, older people, and essential female kits, as well as emergency shelter kits. In total, humanitarians have reached nearly 11 million people in Ukraine in 2023, with almost 1 million in the Kharkivska Oblast alone. 
And as you know, on Friday afternoon, the Security Council held a meeting on Ukraine as well. Uh, and on Saturday, Mr. Kerry briefed on Friday, and he briefed again on Saturday, this time noting the attacks that have happened on towns across Ukraine and then on locations in the Belgorod city in Russia. Um, now I'm going to move on um, <clears throat> to a different part of the world. You may have seen that over the weekend, the UN Interim Security Force for Abye, UNISFA, issued a statement condemning the killing of Nundeng Nyok, the deputy chief administrator of Abye, along with five other people during an ambush by an armed group near Agok. UNISFA warned that this act of appalling and senseless violence risks the gains that have been made towards resolving the difficult situation in southern Abye and calls on all parties to exercise restraint and collaborate in bringing the perpetrators of this crime to justice. The mission reaffirms its commitment to supporting local authorities in the efforts to promote reconciliation, stability, and the rule of law. And I just have a couple of more things to flag from over the weekend. Um, in a statement, uh, we, the Secretary General took note of the closure of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, um, which was established <clears throat> in 2007 to try those responsible for the 2000, 2005 attack in Beirut that killed 22 people, including former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafik Hariri. The Secretary General's thoughts continue to be with the victims and their families of the attack of 14 February 2005 and the connected attacks. And we also, you will have seen that we uh, issued a statement as the UN peacekeeping mission in Mali completed its withdrawal and the Secretary General expressed his gratitude for the service of its personnel. He added that the UN is committed to continue working with the Malian people and transitional government towards the restoration of constitutional order and the promotion of peace and security. The Secretary General also recognized the key role that the mission played in protecting civilians, the mission support for the peace process to the transition and its efforts towards the restoration of state authority. And he paid tribute to the 311 personnel from MINUSMA who lost their lives and the more than 700 who were injured in the cause of peace during the 10 years the mission was deployed. And as we have mentioned, the liquidation period uh, began yesterday. A smaller team is remaining at sites in Gao and Bamako to oversee the orderly transportation of assets belonging to troop and police contributing countries to their respective nations and the appropriate disposal of equipment that belonged to the UN. And the Secretary General counts on the full cooperation of the transitional government to ensure that this process is completed as soon as possible. And finally, actually no, I still have a few things. Um, the World Food Program in Bangladesh is gearing up to restore its critical food assistance for the entire Rohingya population in Cox's Bazar. Uh, yesterday, they started increasing the value of its monthly food voucher from $8 to $10 per person. In addition to increasing this, um, WFP will gradually distribute locally fortified rice to the Rohingya population, starting in one or two camps and eventually extending to all camps in Cox's Bazar and in Basan Char Island. As you know, a sharp decline in resources led to a reduction in the value of WFP's food voucher in 2023. And WFP's monitoring has shown a sharp decrease in food consumption. The number of people struggling to have acceptable food consumption shut up from 79% in June to 19% in November. And I have two senior personnel appointments today. First, the Secretary General is appointing, and please forgive me for my pronunciation, which I'm sure I'm going to botch, uh, Niaratsai Gumbons Vanda of Zimbabwe as Deputy Executive Director for Normative Support in the UN System Coordination and Program Results at the UN Entity for Gender Equality and the Empower of Women, also known as UN Women. And the Secretary General wishes to extend his appreciation to UN Women Director Policy Program and Intergovernmental Support, Sarah Hendricks of Canada, who will continue to serve as UN Women Deputy Executive Director ad interim <laughs> until Ms. Gumbots Vanda assumes her functions. You gotta love our terminology. <laughs> um, Ms. Gumbots 
Vanda is the founder and executive director for Rosaria Memorial Trust based in Zimbabwe. And there's lots more for you on that online. And also today, the Secretary General is appointing Major General Erdenebat Batsuri of Mongolia as force commander of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force in Cyprus. Um, Major General Batsuri succeeds Major General Ingrid Gierde of Norway, to whom the Secretary General is grateful for her exemplary service and dedication. Major General Batsuri has had a distinguished career in the Mongolian Armed Forces, serving most recently as a Chief of Staff at the Mongolian Air Force Command. And there's also more online. And finally, this afternoon at 3 p.m., there will be an in-person briefing by Ambassador Nicolas de Riviere, President of the Security Council for January, and Permanent Representative of France to these United Nations. And French and English interpretation will be available, and I can see you all can't wait for questions. So here we go. Let's start with Maggie. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, starting off with today's news, uh, there was a strike in uh, a densely populated Beirut suburb uh, about an hour or so ago. Several people were killed. Hamas says one of their senior commanders was killed. It was on a Hamas office um, reaction. I mean, we have been, just as you, have been following these uh, recent developments, which just happened a few minutes ago. Um, obviously, the developments are extremely worrying. Um, and I think this just really highlights what the Secretary General had just said about the dangers of the spillover of this conflict in the wider region. Um, well, we don't have all the details and uh, we don't know, we don't have all the facts yet. We know that the Secretary General urges all parties to exercise maximum restraint and take urgent steps to de-escalate tensions in the region. I mean, he, 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 has, he was very clear in that he's mentioned it, that this continued um, fighting is, is, has the risk of a great miscalculation by multiple actors. And I think this is what we've been seeing um, in different parts of the region, sadly. So we again appeal to all members of the international community to do everything in their power um, to prevent an escalation to the situation there. Um, just one other. Yes. Um, Israel said it's withdrawing a couple of its battalions from Gaza and uh, sending some others back for training or retraining. Uh, does the Secretary General have any reaction to that? Does he see it as a positive or negative? We don't really have a reaction to that. It seems that it's more of a tactical, um, a tactical move. Uh, James. So follow up on the assassinations of the Hamas leader and the two other Hamas members who were killed in Beirut. Um, we don't know who was responsible. Israel has not said it was responsible yet, but it looks like the most likely uh, to, be, to have carried this out. So clearly an attack from beyond Lebanon to Lebanon. That would be a breach of the UN Charter, would it not? And the, the Secretary General would condemn that, would he not? Well, since I don't know yet, I don't want to speculate, so I'll leave that to you. Okay, that the, the um, leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, has said in the past that any assassination on Lebanese soil will have a strong response. What is your message to Hassan Nasrallah? I think our message to everyone has been, it's, is the same, that because of the escalating tensions and the fragility of the situation in the region, we are calling to, for maximum restraint from all parties. We don't want any, any, rash, any rash actions that could trigger further violence. And given this is the first attack that's not in the border area, that's actually in Beirut, um, the risk of escalation is probably the highest it's been at any point. Would, you, would the Secretary General agree with that? And does he think, given that, the Security Council should now urgently meet? Well, as I said, I, th I think we find the situation extremely worrying. And of course, it's up to the Council to, to follow up on, on, on this latest development. Um, yes. Um, thank, thank you. you so so uh, um, just to follow up on um, the issue of aid um, to Gaza, 
did you notice any uh, significant change uh, in your ability to deliver aid uh, since the Security Council adopted their last re resolution about 10 days ago? I mean, to be honest, and I think this is something that we've been um, seeing again and again, we, it's still a very challenging situation. Um, it is it, the, the lens uh, that our colleagues have to go through to get, ga uh, to get aid into these places are the really, it's really, they're really stretched, right? And we've heard from, um, from our colleagues from UNRWA, we heard from Martin Griffiths. Um, I mean, you, you will have seen that tweet that he had where there's all these different obstacles that are still there regardless of, of what's happened in the, in the past few days, it's still extremely difficult for us to get aid in there. And especially when, when the people that are delivering this aid are also themselves suffering from this displacement and are under extreme hardship. But, but regardless of that, we continue to, um, to try to fulfill our mandate. Um, but, but, but regardless of, of, okay, well, there's this, there's this personnel issue, but there's also this logistical issue. Um, there are the, in, the layers of inspection that trucks have to, to go through before they even enter. There are confusion and long queues, and there's a lot of uh, crossing points where trucks have been blocked by <laughs> hungry communities. I mean, you, you, you've seen the reports in the media about how the trucks that are going through, people are just really just grabbing onto um, the aid because and eating it right there because they're in this desperate situation. So I wouldn't say that the, I wouldn't say that it has become easier or that the situation has improved. I think our obstacles um, remain day to day. Um, I want to ask you about uh, there was media reports about uh, the former British Prime Minister Tony Blair uh, that uh, he was hired by the Israeli or was supposed to be hired by the Israelis to use his connection to uh, basically uh, influence Arab countries to take Palestinians. Uh, and um, his office said that these reports are not true. But we are talking here about uh, actually forced displacement. Uh, and um, uh, and just last, uh, and putting that forced displacement into um, other titles like uh, voluntary leaving, etc., and we see last week the um, uh, I think on Saturday, Mr. the finance minister uh, of Israeli finance minister Bitzalel uh, said again that the exodus of Palestinians and um, that is uh, talked about uh, sorry uh, that there will be an exodus of Palestinians uh, and instead of uh, from Gaza and instead of them there will be um, uh, Israelis. My question to you here, uh, in his uh, talks, the Secretary General with Israeli officials, but also other high UN officials, um, were they ever approached to take part or to facilitate uh, regarding such issue? Uh, there, were there any talks on this regard? Mm, no, not to my knowledge. So wh wh what is the stand of the UN on this issue? I mean, our position has always been we're against forced displacement, um, period. And the Secretary General has been very, very clear in that ultimately what we continue to fight for is for a two-state solution. Um, yes. Uh, just to straighten out some of the confusion, is all the aid going through Rafa or is Karim Shalom now open? To my understanding, so we've been uh, in content, uh, constant touch with our humanitarian colleagues, and I, I think uh, the latest we have is that Karim Shalom was uh, operating right now, but it, depending on the security situation, this has gone back and forth and fluctuated. So the situation is still very much in flux. questions. Maggie. Uh, one more on the aid and then another topic. Um, do you, does the UN have any evidence 
uh, that Hamas is diverting any of the aid that it is delivering, that it's sent, that the UN is delivering? Not to my knowledge, but I will double check. Okay. And then on Sudan, it seems like there were some developments over the last few days on the political front. Do you have any updates for us? Um, and not right now, but I will also ask for tomorrow, maybe. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, back there. Yes, <clears throat> my name is Abdul Hamid Sayan. Oh, uh, I have. Okay. I, I have a few Hamid. questions. Uh, then we'll go back to Hi. the room. Hi, Abdul Hamid. Okay, can I ask my yes, few questions? Yes, please, please, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Going back to the assassination of Saleh Harouri, the deputy uh, head of Hamas political bureau in Beirut. Today, Turkey expelled 40 Israeli agents because they were preparing for some assassination in Turkey. A few days ago, Israel also assassinated an Iranian senior advisor in Damascus. And today they killed uh, a Hamas leader by a drone, by the way. It is known now. It is an Israeli operation. So uh, the SG keeps asking not to expand the war, not to go beyond the Gaza. But who is doing that? Why the U why the UN does not say things the way they are? Who is expanding the war beyond the border of occupied Palestine? Um, well, from all these reports, we've, we've seen the reports. We have no way of verifying a lot of these reports. But in short, I think what we have been saying is asking for everyone, every single party, um, to exercise restraint. Um, and that every single party includes everyone involved. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay, also today the, the headquarter of the Palestinian Red Crescent in Gaza was bombarded. Five Palestinian workers had been killed. Are you aware of this development? Um, no, but I will follow up on that, Abdel Hamid. Okay, thank uh -huh. you, I continue. By now, the almost 90,000 Palestinians had been either killed, maimed, or buried under the road. 90,000. That means an average of 1,000 people a day, either killed or maimed or buried under the road. 1,000 a day. And so far, no UN official had the courage to call it genocide. Why is that? Well, that I think you've asked uh Farhan and Stefan quite a few times. And yeah. I think it's because it's not up to us to designate it as such. This uh, falls to the appropriate courts. So this is the reason. Uh, and I'll go back so to the room now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for briefing. So my name is Yuya from Kyoto hey. News, Japanese media. So happy new year. So I'll change the topic. So you know, as you know, so the first day of this year, so the powerful uh, earthquake hit Japan. So do you have any comment to Japan, and do you have any plan to help support for Japan? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've all seen what's happened in the past 24 hours, 48 hours in Japan. Um, the Secretary General is deeply saddened to hear of the loss of life and the damage caused by the earthquake. Um, and he expresses his solidarity with the government and the people of Japan, and we extend our sincere condolences to the families of the victims and wishes swift uh, recovery to those who were injured. Um, and then, of course, we also saw the reports about the, the plane um, accident, and sadly, which was uh, with a Coast Guard that was delivering aid um, to uh, to those impacted by the earthquake, and you know, well, I think uh, thankfully no one, um, everybody in the plane got to safely uh, got to safety uh, time in a timely manner. Um, we still, uh, our thoughts are very much with the people of, of Japan at this time, and we hope that they they manage to recover. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Going back to Gaza. You mentioned that you had no UN has no information about the diversion of possible aid by Hamas. I was just wondering, since Hamas, you know, has run and still runs a part of the country, is there any connection or communication between the UN and humanitarian efforts and Hamas? In other words, is Hamas playing any role even at this point in terms of getting the aid out? 
I mean, I think wherever we go, regardless of where it is in the world, we try to, we have to deal with a variety of actors and we always try to do our best to get the aid delivered. Um, that's, that's pretty much, I could say, like this, this always varies, right? People would ask us this in Afghanistan. People would ask uh, this in you know, Myanmar, wherever it is. Um, and all I can say is that our colleagues, because they are humanitarians, um, we don't want to politicize aid. And all I can say is that they do their best to um, deal with whoever is on the ground to make sure that the aid gets to those who need it the most. Okay. And with that, I will see you here tomorrow. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.